So to get started, my panel, I love these guys. These are amazing people. Well, first, I'm Christine Gonzalez. I'm senior project manager and storage tank queen here at Entech Engineering. And whenever there's a formal like, uh, occasion like this, I like to wear my, my tank crown. Uh, my colleague, Chris Hannum, he's a principal here at Entech Engineering, and he has 30 years of experience in wastewater and water engineering. Ed Petrosky is returning for his third round table. Uh, he's Entech's director of technical services with more than 40 years of experience. Dale Miller personifies Entech. Oops, personifies Entech's longtime focus on operators when helping our clients. He's been with Entech for three years now as an operations specialist, and he has 27 years of operations experience. Brian Wu is a, whoops, <laughs> Brian Wu is a product manager uh, based out of Texas with biosolids management and resource recovery for Vivo. He has 14 years of experience in the industry. And finally, Doug Muller, he's the president of Eastern Environmental Contractors Inc. and has been doing this for 40 years. So I look at this panel, this is a dream team, 150 years of experience, amazing. So before we get into any questions, I see one come in already from our audience. We always like to know about you guys. We like to know what your experience is. Uh, so we want to start off with a, just a general poll, and that's based on uh, what is your experience with aerobic digestion. So if you could respond to the poll, we'll give you about 20 seconds. So uh, anywhere from brand new to it, um, to you know, some bits and pieces, yep, your plant has it, or <laughs> I love this one, I should totally be on your panel, <laughs> and I always find, it seems like there's always a lot of N-Tech people, um, Bob Kearns, Rob Horvat, they're always the ones like, I should be on your panel. <laughs> but um, as Ed mentioned, with these panels, we don't want to stack it with NTech people. We like a good round, uh, rounding of people that we rely on, people in the industry who have different expertise and people that we rely on for these sorts of things. I'll give you a few more seconds. So experience with aerobic digestion. I'm going to end the polling and we'll share the results. So it looks like. Uh, when it comes to, uh, so poll results, I'm familiar with the process. So that's 80%. So a vast majority of you guys are familiar with it. So it uh, sounds like uh, basic familiarity uh, and not that many who <laughs> are really into it like our panel. So that's good. It uh, gives us a sense of sort of what level we should be speaking to everybody. Uh, with in regards to uh, our talk today. So thank you for that. We appreciate it. Reminder again, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And to kick things off, first thing I thought was, okay, what exactly is this aerobic digestion thing? So um, we looked at the definition. Uh, Ed actually helped me out with this definition from the US EPA. And it's a biochemical oxidative stabilization of wastewater sludge in open or closed tanks that are separate from the liquid process system. There's a presence of oxygen, but an absence of food. And one thing we thought we'd share with you, because I was very curious. Uh, so Ed, if you want to take it from here, as far as looking at um, the, well, and just a reminder to our audience, when we're sharing the screen, you can actually move the people. You can, uh, if you see our faces off to the side, grab the menu bar at the very, very top. You can move us around and get us out of the way if you need to. So Ed, 30 seconds. Take us through a typical wastewater plant and where is the aerobic digestion here? Well, it's all the way down the bottom where it says sludge digestion. And I, I thought for our purposes, this was a pretty good diagram because sludge digestion could be aerobic or anaerobic. And I'm not going to go through the treatment process, but you see a primary settling tank, primary clarifier. You see a final settling tank, a final clarifier. These are the places where the sludge usually comes from. You can have primary sludge settle, send it to your digester. You can have activated sludge settle. You can have solids from a trickling filter, RBC process settling and heading down to the digester. Um, you can have not a final settling tank, but you could have a sequential batch reactor where you're settling solids. The thing about the biological processes, those sludges are usually pretty thin in terms of percent solids. Quite often we thicken them before we put them in the digester. And that just helps keep digestion tanks smaller. 
and increases detention time. But that's pretty much where it's coming from. It's the, the gunk that's making the pure water sewage. We're getting it out, but it needs a little more treatment. And that's what happens in the digestive. Okay, excellent. Thank you. It's very, very helpful to you know, have an overall understanding of what's going on there. So whole point of this conversation today is um, think about aerobic digestion over the past 20 years and what are the major changes we've been seeing and what should the operators and owners out there know about, about these changes? What could they do to improve their plants? So I'm going to kick it off to Chris Hannum to get started. He's the one who actually, he may have come up with um, sort of an overview of what we're covering. So Chris, I'm curious, what do you think is the, what's the biggest change you've seen in aerobic digestion over the past 20 years? I think from a design standpoint, we went from uh, a big concrete tank with coarse bubble diffusers, 30 SEM for a thousand cubic feet call of the day and hope for the best. I think now we're seeing uh, there's definitely an increased level of sophistication, uh, better oxygen transfer, better blower control, covers. Uh, this has become uh, equivalent to what we've seen on, on, on the biological treatment process. We've upped our, our game, so to speak, uh, with more complexity in aerobic digestion. Dale Miller, I'm curious, what have you seen? What do you think is the biggest change we've seen in aerobic digestion the past 20 years? I, I agree with Chris there that I'm, I think people are starting to understand that there are <clears throat> big advantages if you watch what's going in there. Uh, 20 years ago, you dumped it in the digester, you left the air run, you shut it off, you decanted it, and you hauled it away. And nobody really paid a whole lot of attention as to what was going on in there. It, it, to me, a lot of them were not digesters, they were just holding tanks that were aerated and then got hauled away. Uh, they say today with the online monitoring of tanks and things like that, you can do so much. And also with the BNR requirements, biological nutrient removal for treatment plants today, you gotta know what you're doing when you're decanning these digesters because you can blow your whole process right out the window if you're not paying attention to what's going on. So like Chris said, the biological treatment aspect has made people pay a lot more attention to the aerobic digestion part of the plant. Interesting. Okay, Brian, I'm curious. Um, so give us a little background on what your company does and what's the biggest change that you guys have seen in the past 20 years? Well, Ovivo, Christine, they, uh, we basically have a solution or a piece of equipment for almost any part of a wastewater treatment plant more specifically, the department that I work in is the Biosolid Stabilization and Reuse Group. And we, as Ed mentioned, there's a couple of ways to treat the sludge. One is anaerobically digestion, and then one is aerobically digested. And I specialize in aerobic digestion design and operation. So although I don't have 20 years of experience, I have 14 years of experience, but what I've seen, and I think Dale kind of stole my thunder, in terms of what is different, I guess, 20 years from now, or when I first started till now, is operating and designing aerobic digestion systems for BNR, because it's really been uh, observed and, and evaluated that the solids handling part of a wastewater treatment plant really impacts the main treatment process's ability to meet BNR limits. And the tighter the limits are getting, the more concern there is um, that the biosolid side has on the impact of the main treatment process. And then as Chris alluded to, the level of sophistication in terms of the design and the operation. And I think Ovivo has a lot of that expertise and know-how in terms of do that, in terms of how to do that. And I know we've worked, you know, quite a bit with Entech on how to do that. Brian, um, you said BNR, is that right? biological nutrient removal. So um, uh, from the biological process, you generate lots of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. And if you discharge too much of that um, in, uh, in water streams, what, you, what can happen is, is that you can have excessive algae growth. And if you have too much algae growth in, for instance, the Chesapeake Bay is a big body of water that's you know, pretty close to your neck of the woods. It's also a common waterway that's discharged from 
um, wastewater treatment facility. So if we discharge too much nitrogen and phosphorus, you can have a lot of algae growth um, in receiving streams. And that's not good because that can deplete the oxygen in the water and that could kill aquatic life. So obviously we want to try to eliminate the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus, which is why you know wastewater plants now have to meet um, nitrogen and phosphorus limits typically. Okay, thank you. Doug, I'm curious. Uh, first, explain if you can explain a little bit about what you guys do, and then what's the biggest change you've seen in the past 20 years in regards to aerobic digestion? For my expertise is in construction, installation, repair of water and wastewater treatment plants. Uh, specifically, I like anaerobic digestion more than I do aerobic digestion. Uh, I have a lot more experience in that. Um, the major changes to piggyback on what everybody else said, I think it's really controls and the complexity of just uh, aerobic digester. You know, 30 years ago, they put a hundred horsepower blower in, and we didn't, we did, we did, we weren't concerned about um, electrical usage or efficiencies or, or decanning. Um, so I, I think the the biggest change is the complexity of operation, allowing uh, people can remotely monitor through SCADA, uh, and the complexity of the construction that goes along with it. So, uh, so question from our um, from our attendees. What type of controls uh, and why? Do you want me to? Do you want me to? I, I, this is for everybody. So since you just um, you were the first person to, I mean, everyone mentioned sort of controls, but you're you, what 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 are the biggest changes you've seen as far as controls go? Again, I'm not an engineer. There's much smarter people on this panel than myself here. But uh, you know, DO control, valve control. You know, uh, just just trying to make sure that the mix is correct. Uh, Brian had touched on it, the BNR control to, to take an aerobic digester and turn it into something that's not just an aerobic digestion. Brian? Yeah, I guess to add on to Doug's uh, comment, I found it interesting, and I think this is a pretty good uh, discussion point, um, that he prefers anaerobic over aerobic. I'm an aerobic guy, so, oh, you know, uh, I'm going to prefer aerobic, you know, day in and day out. Now, having said that, there are advantages to anaerobic that it's less energy intensive compared to aerobic and it's more ideal for bigger wastewater treatment plants. But anaerobic and, you know, it, it's interesting that we touched that, you know, uh, that aerobic is generally a simplified process, although there is some form of level of sophistication with aerobic, you know, digestion. Um, but what the main advantages of aerobic over anaerobic is odors, number one. So anaerobic, you're going to have odors related to ammonia and hydrogen sulfide. And also because of the nature of the anaerobic process, we're talking about BNR. Well, anaerobic, if you have um, side streams uh, from anaerobically digested sludge, they can have thousands of parts of ammonia and hundreds of parts of phosphorus going back to the head of the plant. So that would definitely compromise the main treatment plant's effectiveness to meet any BNR limits compared to an aerobic process where the side stream is generally going to be much, much lower. Um, and also the, the capital cost um, for uh, equipment for aerobic is generally going to be lower than anaerobic. But you know, there are you know, going to be advantages and disadvantages. Now, in terms of airflow control, as Doug mentioned, you can certainly do a DO control, but uh, from Ovivo's perspective, we feel that the pH is a better way to control your airflow. And I say that because if you know your pH, you basically know what biological process you're in in an aerobic digestion process. So it makes it uh, a lot easier to know what type of airflow adjustments to make. So in other words, if your pH is increased, it means that you have, you might have some ammonia in your digester. Um, so to get rid of the ammonia, you need the nitrification process to happen. And in order to do that, you need to increase your airflow so that you can get the nitrifiers to oxidize the ammonia into nitrates. And then if your pH is low, that indicates that the nitrification process occurred. And in nitrification, you create acid. So if you create too much acid, then you can uh, kill the biology. So in order to um, prevent uh, your nitrification to go unchecked, then you would want to either reduce your airflow 
or turn off your airflow so that you can get the denitrification process to happen. And the reason why you need to either decrease the airflow or turn off the airflow is because the microorganisms will um, prefer to oxidize oxygen as opposed to nitrate. So you're really forcing the microorganisms to use the nitrate as opposed to oxygen. So those are, I guess, maybe some of the, the techniques in terms of airflow control or controlling the system that have been different that I guess, Doug, you may have alluded to, but in a little bit more details, of course. Interesting. Thank you, Brian. I'm curious, Dale, um, have you, you've operated both types of plants, is that right? Yes. Yeah, I've, I've operated anaerobic and aerobic, and I'm, unfortunately, I'm on Doug's side. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm an anaerobic guy, although, that, you know, that's usually only larger wastewater treatment plants, usually only over like 5 MGD or something like that. And we all know there's a whole lot more smaller plants than there are larger plants. Um, so how, how come you like those better? Well, it, as, as much as everybody makes it out that they're so difficult to operate, anaerobic digesters, they really aren't. If, if you just do your homework, do the test you're supposed to do, watch what you're supposed to do, they're really not that difficult to operate. Uh, I, I just wanted to make a comment on the control question that you had. Yep. Oh, yeah. um, technology also has driven a lot of this now with online instruments that can be in the aerobic digesters at all times. 15 years ago, those instruments were very, let's just say, I, I would say unreliable, where today with the technology advancement, you can put those probes in there. You know, some places you can clean them once a month. You might have to clean them once a week, but the cleaning thing is pulling out of the tank and wiping it off and sticking it back down there. It takes two minutes. Where before older technology, they had wipers on them. You had to take them out. You had to take them apart. You had to calibrate them. You had to do all that. Where today, you don't need to do that. It, it's so much easier. And to allude to Brian's comment about shutting blowers on and off. You know, years ago, you, you went out and you bought a torque timer that cost 15 bucks and you put it in the panel and you hooked the wires up to it and you pulled the pins out and it shut the blower on and off. Today, you can take that technology of the DO probes or pH or whatever you prefer to run by, hook that to your SCADA system and it turns the blower on and off all by itself. You, you don't even have to do anything. You just set it. So controls have come a long way and it has actually improved the aerobic digestion side greatly with that. Interesting. Ed? Yeah, uh, interesting thing on a lot of this with controls and, and the, as I call it, the headworks load, the, the load that decant from a digester or liquid from your dewatering operation, that load that it puts on the headworks in the treatment plant. Um, it's a lot, and Brian was talking about that, the ammonia, the phosphorus, the nitrate, the nitrate. As we're talking about the Chesapeake Bay, which you know anybody who's designed a plant or operated a plant in Susquehanna River Basin in Pennsylvania knows, that's a significant factor. Um, when we first started talking about the Chesapeake Bay, I, I presented a paper at Pentex saying, can aerobic digestion improve the Chesapeake Bay? And, and it can, because there's only so much capacity in the treatment plant to nitrify and denitrify, to remove those nitrogens, to remove those phosphorus. And if you run an aerobic digester properly, and I have a couple of clients that the decant from the digesters is so clean, it could be directly discharged. I'm talking ammonias, less than one part per million, I'm talking total nitrogens of less than 10, and phosphorus is sometimes one or two milligrams per liter if, if you just operate it the right way. Now, a lot of that comes down to the controls. What Brian is saying about the pH is very valid. I like my operators to measure ammonia and NO3, because when I see ammonia going up, I'm like, uh-uh, more air. And when I see NO3 going up, I say, shut the air off and let it denitrify. And here's the key. If you're putting out low ammonia, you're putting out low NO3, that digester is running so good that you're burning solids up like crazy and you're reducing your sludge volume and you're reducing the amount of money you're spending at the landfill or however you're getting rid of your sludge. Performance of the digesters they can really be fine-tuned. 
and it just helps you all around. And low energy is a given if you're doing it the right way. Chris? Hey, to piggyback on what Ed is talking about too, that inefficiency, an improperly designed facility, you're paying both ways. You're paying inefficient use of electrical power to, to aerate, and then you're not efficiently destroying volatile suspended solids. So you're now getting a double whammy of having to pay for it by taking extra solids out. Um, I won't call it low hanging fruit, but, uh, and I know Ed's done a ton of these where that's one of the first places we look energy efficiency wise when we go into a plant. Besides your, your main blowers and your main prime movers of, of your, your forward flow pumps, aerobic digesters are usually where their savings involved as well, as far as improving on them. My question though, and I'm gonna throw this grenade into the middle um, and then step back. And this is really, I'm curious from the operator to the manufacturer to Ed, is thicker, and I, I've had this debate with Ed, is thicker in a digester better? In other words, you talk to a lot of operators that are constantly in a state of decant and they're trying to get the sludge as thick as possible. I've personally seen some problems with that uh, as a practice on two different levels. Um, but I'm curious, <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let Ed and Brian talk about this. Well, if you would let me go first, okay? <laughs> age, age. When I, when, when I talk about thickness in an aerobic digester, uh, I want to make a McDonald's milkshake look like water. I want that stuff as absolutely thick as I can get. I should have said a McDonald's chocolate milkshake. Um, I want it as thick as I can get. And the realistic pop point there is around 4%. And I know, Chris, you're going to say, oh, no, you, you, you can't aerate it. You can't mix it. <laughs> and let's go up to Waymart. Randy Skates is running the damn thing. Some days I talk to him, he's like 4.1%. And he's just burning it up. And okay, we've got a couple little tricks up there that not everybody has, you know, membrane thickening of, you know, aerobically digested sludge, but we can do it. Now, the other side of the point is if you go throw a DO meter in that tank, you cannot get a DO reading. Okay? It, it's just either it's too thick, or here's the other thing the DO is too low. And of course, everybody wants to water, walk around and say, oh, my, you know, my digester should be one part per oxygen or one and a half parts of oxygen. Some days we can't get a reading at Waymark, but there's no ammonia. There's like less than one part of ammonia. You can't get rid of the ammonia if you don't have enough oxygen in the digester. The point is, it's digesting so well, it's using the oxygen up as fast as putting it in. So thickness, I want it as thick as I can get. Absolutely every time. I've done pre-thickening, uh, I've done uh, thickening pelts, and you know we did Waymart and SEI Dallas about four years ago, where we stuck membranes into them. And I got to tell you, that's the cat's ass. Hey, I'll give us the operator's perspective. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I have a, a question for Ed. So when you when you get the four percent, what's your blower doing? What what do you what are you spending all your money on when it's 4%? Are you aerating it or are you trying to mix it? Well, if you got the right mechanism, you're doing both at the same time. And if you use shear tube aerators, okay, and, and personally my favorite is the, the big four foot diameter shear tube in the middle of a round tank. But as long as you got the shear tube aerators, you're mixing it, you're aerating it, and you're aerating it efficiently. And when you got plants that are burning up 70% of the volatile solids, you're, you're spending that money very wisely. I just was talking to uh, one of our clients last week. I was at their place. They're spending $130 a ton tipping fee at the landfill. Just an absurd amount of money. And we're going to start doing a study for them to see if we can knock down the volume of sludge going out the gate. I've done conversion. 
I've converted anaerobic digesters to aerobic digesters and had phenomenal results. And I've done two upgrades with Entech. One of them achieved a 50% reduction in the amount of cake going out the gate. And the other one, 57% reduction in the amount of cake. So you can really improve a digester um, doing this and really cut your operating costs. And oh, by the way, one of those got an energy efficiency rebate from PPNL because we reduced the amount of power it was using in the digester for aeration. So do you have a sense like over the course of three or four years, does it pay for itself or 10 years to do an upgrade it, like that? It, it depends on a lot of factors, but if you're hauling sludge to a landfill and you got a pretty good tipping fee and you're generating a lot of sludge because you're really not digesting, you're just aerating it for a while and getting rid of it, you can absolutely um, save a lot of money and pay for it three, four, five years probably in a, in a lot of cases. Uh, we did membranes, it was a $700,000 project at a, at a Dal SCI Dallas prison and the payback on that project was about three years. Wow. Brian? Yeah, I guess I'm gonna go ahead and try and answer Ski or Chris and, and Dale's question here. So I guess, uh, Chris, get back to your question. Thicker definitely has its advantages, but you have to be careful not to thicken too much because if you thicken too much, you're, you know, I don't care, even with our diffuser system, you know, which is perfect for thickened solids application, it has its limitations in terms of oxygen transfer. And I completely agree with Ed that 4% really, you know, is the maximum that you can go up to in terms of getting adequate oxygen transfer into the tank. And then to get back to Dale's question, um, when you're at 4%, you know, you got to also understand that if you have, say, two digesters, it's the first digester is not going to be mixing limited, okay? You have to also consider the air required to burn volatile solids. And when you thicken that thick and you're designing for lower oxygen transfer efficiencies and alpha values, um, then your process air requirements become bigger than what is required just to mix the tank. So you have to have those considerations as well. So I guess, you know, Chris, getting back to your question, you have to really, we can do thick, but there are several factors that you need. Number one is you have to have the right diffuser system. You have to have good mixing, and then it has to be designed properly in terms of an airflow requirement. You have to use more conservative alpha values, more conservative oxygen transfer efficiencies, and things like that. But if you take those factors into play, going thicker should not be a problem based on, again, as Ed alluded to, we have so many plants that have very, very good results where they thicken very, very thick, up to 4% solids, and we've seen some pretty phenomenal results. A uh, question from our um, audience. Uh, uh, Ed, can you um, comment what facility was a PP&L rebate at? It was down in Frackville. They actually got a, a rebate from PPNL that was based on the energy savings before and after. And Entech didn't calculate that. PPNL calculates that. They come in. So that was like independent third party. If anything, they, they want to lower that number because <laughs> they're paying it. And it, it, was, it was a good number. So, and, and here's the thing, you, you get this rebate. Okay, it's a one-time rebate, but the rebate is based on the amount of energy you're saving on an annual basis. Well, you still keep getting the energy saving every year. And as power rates go up, that savings is actually getting bigger every year. So uh, you can do it. They're, they're, you, know, you can get the energy efficiency. Now, some of this, when we talk about thickening, you know, it's a two-edged sword. If you're building one of these things from scratch, okay, I don't have a tank. I can build it whatever size I need. But a lot of times we're going into a treatment plant and it's existing and we're doing an upgrade. 
Well, there's the digesters. There's the volume. Do I build another tank or do I say no? A thickener is a lot cheaper than a 200,000 gallon concrete tank with an aeration system in it. And if you can thicken, you can potentially use the exact same tank you got, just put thicker sludge in it. But again, you need the aeration system to support it. Okay, do you know, I wanna pull in another question from our audience. Uh, do the panelists have any preference in diffuser type for aerobic digestion? <laughs> Why are you well, laughing, Brian? <laughs> well, because, Brian tells the what he says. <laughs> because I'm biased and uh, I feel that the single drop diffuser is the perfect diffuser for a thick and solid application. I say that because it's a non-clogged diffuser and as Ed could attest, at Waymart they ran the project or even at Muncie. Muncie, they ran that plant for many, many, many years. Didn't have a, one single clog diffuser. Okay, and we know when you thicken in an aerobic digestion, one of the things that you do is that you turn the air off. Well, when you let that, when you turn the air off and you let the solids settle to the bottom, well, what can happen to your diffuser? They could clog, right? So the single drop diffuser design really prevents that from happening. And if the diffuser clogs, well, guess what the operators got to do? They got to go into the tank. They got to clean the, the diffuser, which is not a fun job to do. With a single drop diffuser, you know, you don't have to do that. Not only that, in the rare event that the single drop diffuser does clog, it's very, very easy to maintenance. You don't have to drain the tank or, or take it out of service. You know, you just basically unscrew the orifice cap that is not submerged in the liquid level, and you basically just stick a rod or a pressure hose down the drop pipe and get the clog out. And then with our diffuser system, you can add a shear tube, which improves the velocity of the mixing. So mixing, particularly in thick and solids applications is extremely important. And when you add the shear tube to the single drop diffuser, you really, really get that good mixing up to 4%. So, you know, that's kind of my take on what's the best diffuser for aerobic digestion. Chris, what's your experience? Um, the, the the standard war horse used to be the 24 inch stainless steel diffuser. Uh, we'd snap them in everywhere. And uh, although I agree, Brian, there are some diffusers out there that when you let the flood settle on them, uh, we had problems with them. I think back in the 80s, we were even using ceramic diffusers, which failed miserably. Um, the stainless steel war horses that I talk about, uh, I, I don't know that those needed as much cleaning as as anything else that's on a finer level. Um, now we're seeing more of a membrane. Uh, I think EDI has kind of a tube diffuser that expands and then collapses back on itself so that it'll protect itself. So there's, and I, I appreciate Brian's bias, but there's, there's other options that are fit for purpose out there as well. Um, so, but going back to the, the, pseudo argument that I was trying to start. Um, thicker means smaller tanks, less concrete, which is you pay for that once, you pay for the concrete tank once. So when you design a thick system and you're gonna say you're gonna thicken it, you're really decreasing your capital cost on the initial outlay on your construction. What I've never seen is anybody balance that and say, okay, thicker means more energy for mixing. Um, there's, there's a bunch of studies that have come out now from based around MBRs that we weren't seeing oxygen transfer work. A lot of guys studied it and said, oh yeah, when you're up over, like Ed was saying, north of 3% solids, your alpha, which is directly correlates to how much oxygen you can transfer, um, drops from about 0.7 down to about 0.1. So it's, it, it's that much of a decrease. Okay, over 20 years, I saved money up front on the concrete, but how much more have I paid in electric? And I've never seen, and I don't know if Brian's come across that. I don't know if you've looked at it, Dale, from an operation standpoint. I've never seen that comparison made, that life cycle analysis to say, yeah, you're going to save money on concrete, but you're going to pay more over the life and operating cost. Is that... 
too far afield? No. Uh, it's an awesome question. Anyone ever give a feel or a sense of, of which is better? I, I would say, yeah, I would say, Chris, I have never seen that actually done. Uh, it, it probably should be. Um, because when you get, again, as you said, when you get to the me, I'm thinking two and a half percent or three percent. Ninety percent of your energy is used to mix it. It's not aerating it. It's just mixing it. So the thicker it gets, the harder it is to mix. So then you're getting less less oxygen transfer, which in the end is not always a bad thing because when you get to that point, most of your organics are already consumed. You don't need to have DO or much DO because you're already digested what you're trying to what you're trying to accomplish. But then of course you've got to move that stuff because if you don't it's going to be a little bit stinky pretty quickly so you gotta you gotta move it around but i i think that's a really good question chris to to you know figure and out and what gonna, that and i don't have the, i don't have the answer dale i, I yeah. i've been doing this i have never seen anybody break it down that way so if anybody has share it yeah so yeah out in the audience we're not well, only taking me, questions and answers here about I haven't done the study in the way you talk about it, Chris, but we got an energy saving rebate of Frackville because we made the sludge thicker so it would stay in there a little longer. And we even put new blowers in. And it wasn't just the blower, it was partly the, it was a large part that diffused. And there's a reason for that when you're looking at these shoe tube diffusers. The, the war horses you refer to it, and that is, you know, the, the those stainless steel diffusers, the long non clogged ones, they were the industry standard for a long time, and they're still great diffusers. And you put them usually at the bottom of the tank, maybe six inches up, maybe 12 inches up, and you got 15, 18, 22 feet of water. I, I build digesters that are like 30 feet deep. Okay, uh, or convert digesters, they're 30 feet deep. And you got all this head pressure on top of that diffuser, and your and your blower's blowing this air and it's just banging it out at high pressure to get it all in there. The shear tube diffuser, the bottom of that diffuser where the air comes out could be six, seven, eight feet above the bottom of the tank. But the shear tube extends down to about 12 inches above the tank. What it's doing is it's blowing the air into the shear tube at a much lower back pressure. And the draft tube, the shear tube, is pulling the sludge off the bottom of the tank. And it's a very effective mixer because what you've created is an airlift pump in the tank. So when Oviva does those calculations, they're going to show you how much air you need for mixing and how much air you need for digestion. And it's interesting that a lot of times the numbers are very close. It's more a function of tank configuration and shape than it is um, the actual oxygen requirement for digestion. Now, in Muncie, where we were using sludge off the bottom of digest or off the bottom of clarifiers, or you had pockets, and the operators would thicken in the clarifier before it went into the digestion, you had very, you know, very very thick sludge. Uh, we were digesting so well in the summertime that we were generating tremendous amounts of heat that the aerobic digesters were approaching 100 degrees centigrade and, or 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, 32, 33 degrees centigrade. We don't want it that high. And to control the heat, we were actually shutting the air down. We were stopping the digestion process. That happened on startup. For 13 years, that digester operated by operating the blowers for six hours on, six hours off. Six hours on, six hours off. The blowers, given the size they were, they only ran half of the time. And that was enough to get rid of all the ammonia and to have low nitrogen numbers. And 50% of the sludge went away in the first school year of operation after the conversion. So I haven't done the study exactly the way you're talking about it, Chris, but I've seen enough of them out there to say that we're not up in the power consumption when we do this, the overall power consumption of the plant. So I think 
it might be an interesting thing to do. My sense is you're going to find that it pays off, but not just in tank size. In sludge reduction, better effluent to the headworks, or better deep tank quality to the headwork. I think there's a number of things you got to look at besides just the cost of the tank. You know me, though, Ed, I'm a documentation person. I, I, I want to be able to hold something up and point to it and say, yeah, we, we've studied it. Um, You're an engineer. You like data. You can't help yourself. A quick question. When we keep talking about 4%, 4% of what? What is, what is the 4%? It's the solids concentration of the sludge. So when it's wasted from the main treatment process, Christine, it's usually wasted between a half a percent and 1%. And there are different mechanisms in which to thicken the solids. And, you know, as, you know, many of the panelists have already alluded to, one of the reasons for thickening is to increase the capacity in the tanks in order for you to have a longer digestion time for the solids to be stabilized. Um, that's one of the purposes. And say if you have existing tanks and, you know, to stabilize the solids to class B biosolids, for instance, which is where you can land apply the sludge, you need to hold the sludge for, say, if you're, you know, operating two tanks and your temperature is 15 degrees C, the EPA requires you to store the solids for 42 days. So if you already have tanks on site and you could thicken to increase the capacity of those tanks to where you don't need any additional tank volume to meet those stabilization requirements, that brings a lot of value. To add on what Ed is saying, that you just can't look at the digestion piece of it. Where it's really, really critical, and the reason why it's high value to optimize aerobic digestion or any solid stabilization is because you can improve a lot of the other parts of the plant. As Ed alluded to, the main treatment process, for instance, is one where you can improve the operation. We talked about how the solids handling systems can you know, really negatively impact the main treatment process, particularly if you have a nitrogen and phosphorus limit. If you send too much nitrogen and phosphorus back to the head of the plant, well, there's only two ways that you could really treat it. Number one is that you have to treat it in the main treatment process. You have to provide more oxygen. So that cost probably is hidden when you guys do your engineering evaluations. So if you send too much ammonia back to the end of the plant, now you're asking for your main treatment process to provide more oxygen to oxidize that ammonia. And then secondly, from a phosphorus standpoint, well, if, if you send too much phosphorus and your main treatment process can't treat you know, the phosphorus, you gotta add chemicals. And then those chemicals have a cost. And then when you add the chemicals, not only are you talking about the cost, you're also increasing to your sludge load as well. And as we know, sludge has costs to handle it. And then at Frackville, one of the things that, you know, Ed, you know, uh, one of the reasons why we optimize the aerobic digestion at Frackville is because we wanted the, the their solution at first was to uh, change the belt press. The belt press was already a pretty good piece of equipment. And Ed's thinking was if we improve the digestion, you know, send less solids to the belt press, we can basically keep that existing piece of equipment instead of just buying a brand new belt press. So that's kind of where, you know, the, the value of optimizing aerobic is. You can optimize your main treatment process and you can also optimize if you have a dewatering uh, process downstream. So you can really improve a lot of parts of your wastewater treatment plant if you optimize aerobic digestion. And that's really where the value is. Interesting, thanks Brian. Dale? Yeah, I, I just, your, your question about the percent, 4%, 2%, I just wanna make a statement, you know, okay, so it's 4% solids, well guess what? It's 96% water. That, you, gotta, you gotta think about it the other way and also, you got to remember, if you have a thousand gallons of one percent solid sludge, that is only fifty thousand gallons of two percent solid sludge. So that one percent change cuts your volume in half. Just, just so it, it's something you got to keep in your mind. And also, when we're talking about four percent, and then to me, when you get to eight percent, 
my thought is that's toothpaste. Eight percent solids is like toothpaste. You ever try to pump something like that? It, it it's very difficult. And as sludge gets thicker percentage wise, it becomes more difficult to move, pump, and whatever. Um, I, I just wanted to ask Doug a question because he's sitting over there watching us talk. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure I'm sure he's done a lot of projects where he's either upgraded aerating systems in a aerobic digester or replaced them. Yep. When when you do that and you empty that digester, where's all where's all the nasty gritty stuff sit on the bottom of the tank? It, it's it's right around the corners of the tank. Okay, the edges of the tank. You you bring up a really good point, and I was gonna I was gonna jump in at some point. You know, the head of the plan is important too to make sure that we're removing rags. We're removing grit because it all it all reconstitutes in the digester. Uh, I've taken digesters out that I have six, eight, ten feet of grit, uh, reducing the capacity of the tank at that point. And and to, to dovetail, what's the best diffuser manufacturer? I'm not going to answer that, okay? Because there's just way too many uh, options to it. However, Avivo does offer the the drop tube diffuser, which you can work on, which is is very nice. You know the old workhorse, the the uh, the stainless steel U tubes. Um, I've seen those clogged all the time with rags. Uh, as soon as the blowers are turned off, you have the the loss, uh, and and the the rags get get sucked into the diffusers. So um, a lot of reduction of tank volume uh, with with grit and the 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 non mixing of the corners of the tank and and around the edges. Excellent. Thank you. That was really, really helpful. Um, I just got a request. Uh, Ed, you asked me to pull up a slide for you. So is it a chart you want me to share? Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, is that it? Yeah, there you go. Um, the reason I asked Christine to bring this up, see, I was slightly prepared. I got all this stuff for her yesterday. That's a new one for me. <laughs> when we talk about aerobic digestion, and this is true even in anaerobic digestion, you, you talk about um, a solid retention time, but you also talk about a temperature at that solid's reduction time. And you see how the red curve kind of goes up steep, and then it flattens out, but it keeps climbing. And if you look, you know, multiply your temperature times your solid's retention time, and that's going to approximate the volatile solids reduction you have. And that's what we're trying to do. If you reduce the solids in aerobic digestion, they're reduced to water and carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide goes off to the atmosphere. Water is removed in the dewatering or decanning operation. So the longer you hold it at a given temperature, the more it breaks down. I actually have one of these that I calculated the volatile solids destruction at 77%. So it's kind of like way up on a part of that chart that isn't even shown here. That's where a lot of savings can occur. As we thicken it, we increase the solid retention time. 38% um, on that curve is what the mandate is to keep class B biosolids reduction. So if you're going on farmland or agricultural utilization, that's where you have to be. But if you want to save money in a landfill, you want to get beyond that. So again, the solid thickening, it, it's, it's an important part. And sales, right, you're not going to go 8%, but I have them pre-thickening to 6%. And the reason I do it to 6% is because as it breaks down and the water combines with it, the digester may actually be operating at 3%. There's that much destruction of the solids going on. Interesting. Oh. Chris, um, do, you, do you want me to keep sharing the slide or should I take it off? Yeah, no, I'll just, no you can keep it up there. That 38% for class B land application. Dale and I ran into this, I think last year. Um, if you landfill, you're supposed to hit 38%. A landfill is not supposed to take anything that's not 38% volatile solids destruction. Do they check it and is it enforced? I can't say that it is, but if you have uh, a sludge holding tank and you're taking that directly to a landfill, probably not in compliance. If I can, 
Chris, I know one or two landfills that do check it. And it is part of the, uh, Brian, you correct me if I say this, 503B regulations yep. from EPA? You got it. Yeah. 503 regs. And I know, and this is the part that always grabs us and, and catches us from behind. It's not in the DEP sewage facilities manual that you have to do that. It's in the landfill regulation. And by rights, they are not supposed to take it if it does not meet class B. Okay, a uh, question from our audience. Uh, on the 4.1% thick sludge, are you using a sour test to produce class B biosolids? Uh, if so, how are you pressing, centrifuge, or hauling the liquid sludge? Uh, who can best respond to that question? Chris? You got two options for meeting class B. It's the 38% reduction. If you, can't, if you can't meet it with that, then you go, I guess you could do a sour right out of the chute, but it's more expensive. You're basically, the sour is a specific oxygen uptake rate. And you're, you're basically measuring how much oxygen your sludge taken up. I think the EPA says when it's below 1.5, it's considered stabilized. Brian might have those. Yeah, there. it's 1.5. So in terms of class B stabilization, there are two requirements that need to be met when it comes to being classified as a class B biosolid. Number one is the pathogen requirement where you have to meet one of these two criteria: Pathogens of 2 million or less, or say if you're doing the, uh, the time temperature, you have to, if you're operating at 15 degrees C, then you need 60 days of SRT. And if you're operating it at 20 degrees C, you need 40 days of SRT. So you need to meet one of those two requirements. The other requirement is the vector attraction. As Chris stated, you need to meet one of those two criteria when it comes to meeting the, path, the, the vector attraction. 38% volatile solids or more, or a specific oxygen uptake rate of 1.5 or less. And uh, I think I can answer, I guess, the, the, the person's question. The 4.1, I believe, where Ed uh, said it's Waymart. And Waymart, I believe, has a belt press. That's how they're dewatering. And I believe um, how they're meeting it is, I know that they meet the time temp. No doubt. And even if they did the pathogen, since they have an SBR, I'm pretty confident that they have pathogens of 2 million or less, because if you have an extended aeration plant with digestion, chances are that you need very minimal amount of stabilization to meet a pathogen of 2 million or less. And then the other way is probably they're meeting it with 38% volatile solids reduction. I think at Waymart, we're getting between 40% minimum, but generally we're around 50%. Okay, Dale. Yeah, I, I just have a comment about the sour, the oxygen uptake rate test. Um, a lot more people are going to that today uh, because of advanced treatment through the treatment process where, again, we'll use another new term here, volatile solids. Uh, at the end of the BNR press uh, process is sometimes pretty low. You, usually years ago, activated sludge process when you wasted your and again, this is just a general number, might have been 80% volatile solids in your waste. But today with the, with the recycling and so forth with BNR processes and things like that, your, your waste sludge may only be 75% or maybe 72%. And the whole 38% reduction thing is, a, is really weird. If you start out at 85% and you reduce it to 75%, that's a 50% reduction. But if you go from 70% to 60%, which is still the 10% difference, that's only a 34% reduction. Mm -hmm. So it, it has a lot to do with what you start with. And that's why people today are using the, the sour test, because they can't meet 38% because of what they're starting with. Now, if you're, if you're using, have some primary sludge, then you're in good shape. But if you don't have primary sludge, you can get yourself in a pickle there that you can't meet that 38% number but you can meet the sour test. So that's why, like Brian said, you have to meet one or the other or both, but there's no reason to meet both. So okay, just wanted excellent. to make that comment. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we're gonna do something uh, special for the next couple minutes. Um, hey, one thing if I can. 
Go ahead, Ed. The other thing what Dale is saying is that sour test, it's a test. Grab a sample, do your analysis, there's your answer. To do the time temperature, you got to be taking temperatures every day. You got to be doing volatile solids once or twice a week. You got to be doing, there's a lot of tracking of data to really know what that volatile solids change is. Mm -hmm. But if you just do the sour and if you send it out for the pathogens and you just do the fecal coliform test, again, take a sample, do a test, boom, there's your answer. It's just so much easier for the operator. And it, to me, it's more accurate than shooting a lot of data. Good point. Thanks. Um, we do have about like three or four more questions from our audience. I see we're coming up uh, on three o'clock, so we got another 15 minutes. Um, but we wanted to release another poll to our audience um, just to get a sense of uh, what sort of things you'd like to hear in the future. Uh, we're trying to do these roundtables every two weeks uh, and a variety of wastewater topics as well as water topics. So uh, future roundtables focusing on the wastewater side. Um, just give you 10, 15 seconds. Um, you can vote for multiple ones, but would it be helpful for how to find funding for your projects? Would you like a round table on keeping your team safe in confined spaces? Uh, we routinely give talks at conferences and uh, the presentations are actually available for download on our website. So the ones that are most popular there, well, aerobic digestion, lots and lots of downloads of that, which is why we're doing this round table today. Uh, pumping station design, what operators should know. That's one Chris Hannum's done multiple times and just really phenomenal response, not just at Pennsylvania Rural, but downloads. What I'd really love to see here is have a beer with an engineer. We haven't quite figured out exactly what that is, but a little later in the day, it's just casual conversation. And then if you caught some of our earlier roundtables on I&I, &I, uh, we'd love to do another one on the administration of the whole uh, program. So I'll give you another two seconds and I'll end the polling. And this really helps us for moving forward. So I appreciate your comments from the audience. So if we end the polling and I'll share the results. Okay, pumping station design, what operators should know. So Chris, you're gonna come back for your second round table. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> no, I like, I like that, I like that clash. Oh uh, yeah, no, I sat in on it and I know nothing about this stuff and it was fascinating. It was so, so important to know. So thank you very much to our audience for sharing all that stuff with us. So um, can I move on to some questions or were there any other comments from our panelists on what we discussed so far? Okay, uh, so a question, or actually a comment from Kevin in the audience. He had gotten an energy rebate for $654,000. $654,000 by going from jet aeration to fine bubble diffusers in a 15 million gallon per day plant. So aeration basins plus digestion, like digestion. So he says, yes, savings is awesome. So thank you. I love hearing that sort of success story. Another question, here's an interesting one uh, from an anonymous attendee. Should concrete be lined in digesters? That's a can of worms. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not touching that one. Can I start that one? Yes, Dale, please. It, Dale, you can start and finish that one. <laughs> what, what's, what's the uh, best answer? It depends. <laughs> But yeah, there, there's a lot of discussion about that uh, recently. Um, some people say yes, some people say no. Uh, I don't know what to say. I've seen a lot of aerobic digesters that have held sludge for 35 years and, you know, they don't look new, but they're not in horrible shape. Um, and, I, and I think, too, it, it depends on what sludge you have in there. Uh, if, if, you, if you're turning the air off for 18 hours a day, and creating hydrogen sulfide in there, it's kicking the crap out of that concrete. Yeah. Uh, if you're turning the air off, like Ed said, six hours, six hours on, six hours off, eh, it's not really going to have an effect. So I, I think a lot of it has to depend on number one, how you operate it, and number two, what what's the content of that sludge? Do you have a sludge that has high a lot of hydrogen sulfide in? Hopefully not, but if you do, you, know, you could have a you could have an issue. Um, I've seen some really great lining systems out there that they use. The, the only drawback is they are freaking expensive. 
Yes. It's a lot of capital cost. Now, if you're going to have that tank, you think for 75 years, I'd say go for it. It's a one-time cost if you put the right stuff on there. Uh, yeah, you say one-time cost. Keep in mind, when it comes yeah. to linings, they have a lifespan. So yeah. do we have it? Like, are we getting 20, 20, like in manholes, 20, 25 years out of these linings? What do you, what do you usually see? Uh, um, I you don't know. know. I, I've seen ma I've seen manholes lined. Uh, I have never really went back and looked at them 20 years later, so I don't know. But you're right; they, it doesn't last forever either. So yeah. I mean, if if it's if if you think that tank's going to last 50 years, then you can run that cost out. But if you think in 25 years you're going to have to reline it again, mm -hmm. you got to double that. Well, not that, more than double because in 25 years it's going to cost yeah. four times as much. Yeah, my, my background is with tanks and coatings, right. so I know the tank can last forever. It's that coating, that coating system. What is the lifespan on that? How well was it applied? Are you doing touch-ups or fixing partway through? And uh, rule of thumb, if I can get 20, 25 years, I'm happy. So yeah, that would mean you'd have to look at the lifespan and the cost of that every, every 20, 25 years. So, I also um, think that'd be a good question for Doug. Have, have you built any tanks or redone any things where you have line tanks? Yeah, uh, we've done numerous. It goes back to what you said, Dale. It really depends. Uh, a lot of times we'll take tanks down, we'll see exposed rebar uh, that, that the, the, the concrete is de deteriorated. Line tanks, not so much, uh, meaning a, a, an adhesive. Uh, we will put a high poly or high, uh, um, high content solids epoxy on top of it. We've had good, good experience with that. The problem is there that you can have movement in the tank and there's no elongation with the, the coatings. You'll get cracks and the, the coating is only as good as the failure point. And then you get, you know, the coating starts to fall off. I've seen that happen too. Uh, it really comes down to how you're operating the, the plant. You know, do you have grit removal? You know, how are you mixing the tanks? Uh, things like that. I would weigh on the side that if you're putting it, if you're taking the cost to take the tank out of service, I would probably recommend coating the tank at that point. Um, there's numerous uh, manufacturers out there, Sika, Tademic, uh, both of which uh, offer a high solids epoxies that are, are very abrasive resistant uh, and probably worth the money. Um, square foot to be able to apply that with preparation, sandblasting, no concrete repair, you're anywhere in between $10 a square foot to $20 a square foot. So it can get costly, but it'll also save the integrity of your tank and the rebar and the structure. Yeah, good point. Uh, Ed, were you going to say something? Yeah, and it's, and it's interesting that 46 years I've been in the game of sewage, and in the last five years, I'm looking at two projects, and Christine, you're familiar with the one, where we had to go back and line concrete tanks because of this phenomenon called microbial induced corrosion in concrete. Uh, I don't think there's anybody out there that completely understands what that is yet, but it seems to be a newer thing that we're seeing. Not something, I've seen 50 year old tanks in service. I rehabilitated a 50-year-old tank to use as an aerobic digest once. Uh, but yet, I'm seeing these two projects in concrete that's not 10 years old. So I want to say line it, but I think there's more to it than that. Mm -hmm. There's something going on. Is it mutation of bacteria? Is Are we mutated? not doing concrete the same? I don't know the answer yet. But it's, it's definitely a consideration, Chris. Is there any, and I'm just looking at this coincidentally, I mean, since the advent of BNR, are we seeing more of this? Is, is it something potentially associated with BNR biology? There are some people that are saying that, but, you know, we call it BNR now because of the Chesapeake Bay, but I mean, it, you know, there's been plants since the, since the 70s doing five-stage Bardenzo, and that's BNR. Those tanks didn't fall apart yet. But those are flow through tanks. A lot of the things we're seeing is in SBRs, same tank. It, it is, and, and I, I guess I'm just not enough with a microbiologist to say, what is that different than an SBR versus a flow through? Yeah. I, I think there's something to be said for the concrete, 
uh, and, and I don't even know what that is, but I always make this comparison. <laughs> I love the comparison. I don't know if everybody else does, you know, but the people who invented concrete were the Romans. And, you know, the Colosseum still stands. And PennDAP can't make a bridge that can last 20 years. And now we're starting to see it in sewage tanks. I don't know what that means, but I'm just becoming suspect of the concrete in general. Yeah, good point. <laughs> and, and I have a question piggybacking yeah. on that. What what are what is happening to the interior of the tanks? Is is it spalling? Is it we're actually what we're starting to see is um, a breakdown of the surface of the of the concrete that's in contact with the sewage. Um, it, it would probably take me another 20 minutes to find it, but I actually have two videos of my thumb in two or three separate tanks where I'm literally rubbing the concrete like that with my thumb and wow. the surface is crumbling under my thumb. And I'm wow. not abrading the skin. It's not hurting me to do that. And the, the surface is abrading away after being in the soup for two, three, four years. Can, can you even save the tank once it's at that well, stage? Well, we're saving the tanks, yes. But God, I hate to think that we got to go back and do that with sewage treatment tanks. Um, it's obviously going to be cheaper if we do it as a first cost. But then again, as Christine says, none of these linings last forever. There's all issues with all of them. We did a set of tanks 1919, last year, uh, 2.2 million gallon a day treatment plant, SDR. $1.1 million coded, mm -hmm. not chicken feed. So, so again, if you look at digesters where the reactions are even more intense, and you look at anaerobic digesters where you got more of the sulfides, methanes, you just got to start scratching your head. Or, or do I have to start making them out of some other material besides concrete? Right. I've thought of that. So... Interesting. Chris? Thanks. Yeah, if I could throw a question to Doug, because one of the things, too, we see with these coatings is sometimes the manufacturer requires some sort of certification to be an applier. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you guys go through that certification process? Um, we, we do, but I'll, I'll be quite honest with you. Um, you know, the certification process for Tanemic or Sika, um, there, there's Raven out there, there's some other different coatings it's not such a strenuous process. So the, the, you're, you're trying to just work with contractors that have this certification. Um, you know, we're primarily a mechanical contractor and electrical contractor, uh, but however, we've been trained by SICA and Tenemic to be able to apply it in the spot situations. So the certification isn't as, as critical as you may think. It's, it's really who do they want to sell the paint to at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, I see we're coming up on uh, 315. So I uh, want to do uh, just a quick thank you to everyone out there. And if you're enjoying what you're seeing right now, um, please come back for some more NTech roundtables. We've got uh, several more coming up and we're trying to plan them every two weeks. So um, We've got another wastewater one in two weeks. It's a rehab of wastewater storage tanks. I'm very excited to be leading that round table featuring my friend Mark Babel with Aqua Pennsylvania Wastewater. We've got another sort of general one, a trusted advisor or hired gun, how boards can work better with their engineers. So that will be really, really interesting and helpful. And we're always adding more. So looking to every two weeks. So please check out our website. Uh, there you can even watch videos of past roundtables and uh, more talks and the registration links there. So that's ntecheng.com. And at the bottom right hand side, you want to look for the roundtable recap. That's a picture you can click on and that will take you right to this blog and all the information about our roundtables. So uh, to wrap things up, and we do still have a few questions, so if the panelists are available, we'll still keep talking and answering questions with this fascinating topic, but huge, huge thank you to my co-workers. With NTech Engineering, Chris Hannum, Ed Petrosky, Dale Miller, I love your knowledge. I love you guys sharing your stories, so thank you so much. 
Big thank you to Brian Wu with Avivo. Very interesting information you shared with us. And Doug Muller, thank you. Very good to get the contractor's point of view and better understand these systems. Okay, gentlemen, for these roundtables, I always say magical things happen when you bring together passionate people. You guys are all clearly passionate about aerobic digestion, sludge, and wastewater. So thank you. Thank you so much. It was great seeing you all, and we look forward to seeing you at another roundtable sometime soon. Thanks so much, you guys. Later. Bye. Thank you, Chris. Take Bye. care. Thanks.